Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dan Pybus, I'm a director in the London Transfer Pricing Team specialising in financial transactions. Welcome to our episode regarding the captive insurance section of the OECD discussion draft on financial transactions. This forms part of a five-part series covering different aspects of the paper. I'm here today with Luik Webb Martin, a partner in our financial services transfer pricing practice, primarily focused on insurance. So Luik, to begin with, perhaps I can ask, how has the OECD's thinking developed with regard to captives? It's interesting, Dan, because I think the OECD has come a long way over the last 18 months uh, in its thinking around captives, and that's been influenced in part by the consultations that the OECD has had with taxpayers and with industry bodies representing uh, groups of captives. So I think the OECD, or certainly the constituent members, started in a position of being uh, very sceptical about why taxpayers used captive insurance arrangements. And I think there was a prevailing view back then that many captives, if not all captives, existed solely for the purposes of tax avoidance. I think what's become apparent over the last 18 months, and that's reflected in this discussion draft, there is a recognition there are a range of commercial drivers for why companies will use risk finance, and in particular, a captive insurance arrangement. And I think that shows significant progression. That shows a development in their understanding of the commercial logic underpinning the use of captives. And I think that's good news for taxpayers because it shows the education the OECD has received through taxpayers and through those industry bodies I was referring to has paid dividends. Okay, thanks Louis. And based on the current drafting, what BEPS activity do we think the OECD are focusing on with respect to captives? I think broadly it's three areas. So primarily, first and foremost, the OECD is focused around those transactions whose sole purpose is tax motivated. Effectively, that's transactions that wouldn't happen in the commercial market. So they're really trying to understand which are bona fide, commercially driven insurance transactions and which are the transactions that exist um, mainly or solely uh, to achieve a tax advantage in the territory of the insured, um, because commonly the captive is located in a territory which has a helpful regulatory regime, but often those also have an advantageous tax regime as well. And so that focus around transactions that wouldn't otherwise exist absent the tax benefit that the group generates, I think is the primary focus. And if I think about how the OECD is doing that, it's around the two other areas that I'd refer to. So, so the second is substance. And if I look across the captive industry, I think broadly there are three models of how multinationals run their captive insurance operations. So firstly, there are those uh, taxpayers who have a captive which has the full functionality associated with uh, an insurance business. So that would be um, in-house, full-time employees that undertake the underwriting, that undertake the risk management, that may undertake the claims management as well. So if you like covering the full life cycle of insurance. The second model that we commonly see is co-sourced arrangements, which rely heavily on an outsourced service provider, very commonly a broker, to provide a lot of the administrative and day-to-day -day support for the captive, but again, where there is a core of employees that undertake the key functions, underwriting, for example, investment, and so on. Um, but where we've got this mix then of in-house employees and outsourced providers. And then we see captives that have a fully outsourced arrangement. So there might be the board of the captive with representation from the taxpayer, possibly some non-executives on that board, but effectively all of the day-to-day -day activity of that captive is run by a, a third party um, or indeed outsourced within the group to, to other functions. And in my mind, it's that latter area that is a core focus when it comes to substance because the OECD wants to understand how a captive insurance company can run its business when most, if not all, of those activities that happen day to day are not undertaken directly by the captive itself. So that, that focus around substance is the second area.
The last area then I think is around pricing and that's trying to make sure that the premium that has been charged to the insured um, is an arm's length premium and I think that comes into a number of different areas. One is how you actually arrive at that premium, the different techniques and approaches that can be adopted and the associated pieces around the capital structure of the captive, so making sure it's really got the, the right level of capital to be able to assume the risks that it, uh, it ultimately bears. So for me, it's those three areas, transactions that wouldn't happen absent the tax advantage, it's outsourced models and it's pricing. Okay, so how well does the current draft describe the key functions and risks associated with captive insurance? Well, it's interesting because in the work up to 2010, the OECD, um, along with the insurance industry, spent a lot of time developing the analysis of and description of an insurance value chain in their work on the attribution of profits to insurance branches, and that's reflected in part four of the OECD's paper. In my mind, that is a well-developed, well-thought-through, and generally accepted framework for what the key functions are within the insurance value chain. What's interesting is that this discussion draft does not seek extensively to leverage that work and the result of which is I think that this current draft lacks some of the depth of analysis and the quality of thinking that the OECD already has uh, as it comes to the insurance value chain. So to my mind, there is a strong focus around risk control functions uh, in this paper and I understand why that's there, but I think there is work that has already been done which could and should be leveraged extensively by the OECD as they develop this discussion draft, that skeleton that exists at the moment. The other areas I think where there is work for, for the OECD to do in finalising or achieving a consensus that will eventually become part of the OECD guidelines is around fronting. So the OECD does recognise the use of fronting insurers. This is where there would be a third party insurer which acts as the primary insurer with the insured and then reinsures that risk into the captive. That's a very common arrangement, particularly for certain lines of business. We see that in employee liability risks, for example. We see that very commonly across the life and health space. And in many jurisdictions, actually, it's required by local law. The insured has to uh, insure with a local insurer who then may cede some of that risk to the captive. But in my view, the OECD's thinking around fronting is undeveloped at the moment. And the reason I say that is the current discussion draft fails to recognise the very important role that fronting insurers play when it comes to insurance. That may be because they haven't recognised that the primary responsibility of a fronting insurer is to pay the insurance claim as and when it arises. The fronting insurer then gets to claim itself on the captive. But in order to do that, the fronting insurer really needs confidence that the captive is able to support the risks that have been reinsured to it. And that comes with requirements from that third party fronting insurer to make sure that the, the captive has the right capital base, that it has access to the right liquidity. Um, and that's often reflected in uh, an external rating, credit rating, that the captive has insisted upon by the fronting insurer. The second area, again, where I think there's work to be done is around the prominence in the discussion around agency sales. And that's interesting, I think, because here in the UK, at least, we've seen a transfer pricing case which speaks specifically to this point. But in my experience, the use of uh, agents to uh, broker or sell uh, insurance within a group is relatively limited. So for me, this is something of a niche sport, but the OECD, I think, gives undue prominence, but that's probably reflected by the influence of uh, HMRC and the, the Dixon's case, which is the, the UK case that I refer to in developing the OECD thinking. Okay, applying maybe a slightly different lens now, you've mentioned already capital in one of your responses. I'm interested as to how does the discussion regarding capital more generally factor into the OECD's thinking? 
The, um, the OECD seem to believe that many captives are very lightly capitalised and that's a function of their regulatory capital regime. And we see in many territories that captives are resident that there is a specific regulatory regime that applies to captives and it's a light touch regime often and the capital requirements associated with that light touch regime may be lower than might be the case for a full line insurer and a commercial market insurer. And the OECD's view then appears to be that there are many circumstances where the captive does not have the adequate capital base actually to be able to accept or bear the risks that it, that it, um, it has insured. My view is different. I think from the work that I've done with captives across a wide range of industry sectors, very commonly the regulatory capital requirements set a floor or minimum capital level that the captive has to have, but commonly the captive is capitalized well beyond that level. And in the best cases, the determination of capital is supported by deep actuarial analysis that looks at the expected loss profile of the captive, both in terms of the frequency of claims and the extent or severity of claims as and when they arise. And in order to be confident the captive is able to meet claims as and when they fall due, groups commonly will capitalize their captives well beyond the minimum required under the solvency requirements of the particular regime that the captive is domiciled in. Okay, so from a practical perspective, what are the key challenges we think groups might face in adapting their transfer pricing if the draft remains in its current form? It's an interesting thing because I think it goes beyond pricing. Pricing is one aspect of it, but I think first and foremost, the commerciality of the arrangements is absolutely critical. So being able to evidence why the captive insurance arrangement makes sense, both from the perspective of the insured, so why it would seek to enter into these transactions and why it might expect to do so even if the captive didn't exist. So evidencing from the insured's perspective why these transactions make sense and more broadly being able to show that for the group as a whole, the use of a captive insurer is commercially rational over and above any tax advantage the group gets from that. So that first point about demonstrating why the overall arrangements make sense and then within that why the specific risks that have been insured are commercial market risks that are capable of being uh, insured in the external market is absolutely critical. The second is around substance and, and this goes back to the point I made around the different types of model that we see in the insurance sector. For those that have a captive which has a fully fledged operation within the captive itself, that's going to be a relatively easy challenge to address. For those that operate a co-sourced or outsourced model, particularly where those activities are outsourced to another group company, I think there is a real challenge that those groups face to explain how and why the captive has the ability to underwrite the risk in the first place and how it has the ability to manage claims uh, as and when they arise. So that evidence of substance, I think, is going to be important for certain sectors of the captive world. And the last area, I think, is around evidence and documentation. And that's not only evidence and documentation around that substance, which might be, for example, uh, documenting the role and decision making of the board or any of its delegated committees, underwriting committee, investment committee, for example, but also being able to evidence the paper trail from insured through to the insurance. So showing that the insurance is a bona fide contract of insurance, demonstrating that there is claims that as and when they arise are appropriately dealt with, as well as then the classic transfer pricing documentation covering functions, assets and risks of, in particular, the, the captive insurance company. Okay, so whilst there are some non-consensus areas of the draft, do we have a sense of long-term direction of travel and themes which might remain? I think we do. I think the OECD has now accepted that there are circumstances within a multinational group where the use of captives is appropriate and sensible. I'm not sure that the OECD has yet nailed exactly what those circumstances are. And as an example of that, the discussion draft 
recognises that captives are appropriate where there's a significant component of reinsurance into the external commercial market. Clearly, many captives are used that way. Many captives also retain very significant risks themselves. And I think there is some work to do around uh, explaining to the OECD where the use of captives is appropriate and sensible absent that external market insurance. But that fundamental concept accepting the use of captives I think is real progress. I think that long-term travel is going to focus on these artificial arrangements, uh, especially where we're talking about off-market transactions or risks which would not otherwise be insurable in the external market. And I think the themes that are still to be developed or worked on around the return on capital absent the risk control function. Um, so we've got a lot of work, I think, still to do around defining what that risk control function is. But I think that can be referenced back to the OECD's work in part four on, on the insurance value chain. And I think there's a, a crossover into the work on financial transactions, which looks at the return to capital where that functionality is missing. And that's a really difficult question in a captive insurance world because in many cases, the sorts of risks that are being insured in a captive may be low frequency but high severity. And so the return on that capital may be very healthy where those kind of risks fail to materialize, but could be very significant losses where you have a major claim event. And what I think the OECD hasn't yet grasped is what to do about those super profits if no claims arise or super losses if the claim does arise and where and how those profits or losses ought to be parked. And I guess the other point then that, that remains, which again links back to this issue on commerciality is the recharacterization provision. So what are the circumstances under which uh, the tax authorities can appropriately uh, recharacterize an insurance transaction as being nonsensical, artificial and so on. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Luik. And thank you all for your time today. Please look out for the other episodes in this five-part series, which will cover guarantees, cash pooling, interest rate pricing, and delineation.